we'll jump into it. Cool. And I'll let you lead. Uh, I think Great, we're live thanks now. Very much. Thanks very much, Joel. So today we're going to do something slightly different from the usual programming. Joel and I are going to interview each other on the show, and then we're going to cross post it on both platforms. So really looking forward to that. And of course, we've got Joe Palafinkel from Sutton Capital in New York, and really delighted to be on the show with you today. Thank you. Happy to be here and happy to do this crossover podcast. I um, I got inspired by this because I, I saw two people in the crypto space doing this. So Anthony Pompliano, who's pretty well known in the crypto space, he did something very similar with like another well-known person. Um, so I was like, mm -hmm. you know what, let me try this out with Alex, have a little fun. Cool. Well, delighted to do this inaugural journey together. Um, so a little bit of uh, context for the listeners about how we met. So Joel and I met through a mutual friend, Matthew Holding, and, and someone who, who really gives first, and that's going to be a big topic of today. Um, and um, actually, Matthew was on, on my show, The Tippy Top Podcast, in season one, uh, season two, sorry, episode one. Now, I'll uh, give you a bit of context about Joel. Uh, bear with me. It's, a, it's an impressive bio. So uh, it's actually Dr. Joel Palafinkel. Um, he's a seasoned investor and entrepreneur affiliated with a global network of single family offices, high net worth investors, endowments, and venture capitalists. He's a CEO of Sutton Capital and an LP slash mentor to emerging investment managers. Sutton Capital invests in opportunities focused on FinTech, real estate, B2B SaaS, deep tech space exploration, impact investing, clean tech, and climate change, one of my favorites. And then early in Joel's career, he ran a technology product innovation in FinTech artificial intelligence uh, and for the De Department of Defense. He completed his PhD in modeling and simulation while he was building flight simulators for the de defense industry. A very impressive, Joel, and uh, again, so, so honored to be here with you today. No, thank you, Alexander, and I appreciate you um, running through my bio. But you know what I'm really excited to also cover is a little more of your background. And I know you normally don't get interviewed; you're kind of doing the interview. So, and I often don't get interviewed that much either, right? So it's um, I think it's a fun mm -hmm. experience for both of us uh, to kind of reflect on our career and maybe share things that we've experienced because uh, we're normally working on our listening skills, right? And now we're kind of sharing a little more. So, uh, you know, I'd love for you to give us a little overview on your career and your background, number one, how you broke into venture and, you know, what you're doing right now with the, um, with the development fund, the, the bank, the development bank of Wales. Absolutely. Yeah. Very happy to share. And, and you feel free to, to call me Alex. So in terms of my career, I, I, I had, you know, parents who were entrepreneurs, and that's how I really understood life. You know, they didn't have a nine to five. They were always around home. They were flexible. And um, so actually, when, when I started working, there was this very rude awakening. But going back to the entrepreneurship side, I tried lots of entrepreneurial things at school, had various market days, made, you know, made some money, you know, small money for the time. And then you kind of come out of school and then some people say, right, you've got to study something. So I thought, okay, all right, good at engineering and maths. Let me do that. So I did that for a while, but realized, okay, I'm not really an engineer. I like going out and, or traditional engineer. I like speaking to people. I like business. I like finance. I don't just want to build gearboxes. So anyway, but I finished that degree, realized it would be a good platform in problem solving. And... Um, and it would be a good foundation for anything else I'd want to do in life. Finished that, came out, worked in engineering in R&D for a while, worked in a number of very high tech startups with lots of venture funding. One of them probably had about a hundred million pounds, dollars, pick your currency of funding over its life and wasted much of that and hardly exists today. And I thought I can do this a bit better, but you know, wanting to get more into finance and business as an engineer, you hit a a very thick glass ceiling, as a lot of people call it. So I uh, went to business school to learn the things that I feel I should have learned at school and at university. Turns out they don't teach them to you, so you have to learn on your own battle, do this tertiary education. And I think there's more courses now. We've got Coursera and 
Sphere and Udemy and other ways to learn. And of course, blogs and blogs like this. You know, I did that, uh, learned about private equity, venture capital, and realized, okay, this is what I want to do with my career. This is business. You know, when I was young, I thought I want to be in business, but I didn't understand what that job was. What is business? How do you do deals and sit around board meetings? And, and you know, so anyway, started off in South Africa, uh, private equity, because it's a smaller economy, there isn't as much venture activity, came over to the UK, did some operational transformation, private equity, looked at a large number of deals, and always had this venture stream running throughout it, had done a number of entrepreneurial things. Anyway, long story short, ended up at the Development Bank of Wales. And the way I got in, because at that stage, I wasn't venture, was I led first, I added value first, and got stuck in, did my blog. And off the back of that, people came to me and said, a lot of people talk about wanting to get into venture, but no one walks the talk, and you've embodied that. And that's how I got the opportunity. So if you want to get, if you want to get into venture, don't wait for anyone to give you the opportunity. Take it yourself. You're on mute. I was saying something really passionate, you know, but I was saying, uh, <laughs> uh, and I got all I got all teary eyed and hyped up. But um, but look, there's no clear path to get into venture. You know, you need mm -hmm. to know venture, and people want you to already understand mm -hmm. all the academic and financial aspects mm -hmm. of venture, and you need to have proprietary deal flow coming in. Um, but there's not really a there's not really something that can give you that. Um, up front. So you have to find your way um, mm. and, and hustle and build relationships. And that's kind of really been the, the main reason why I launched, you know, this program to kind of get people doing the stuff, kind of, you know, getting some um, conversations going and kind of building some of those skill sets. But then really it's just the, the network and the academics around it. Mm -hmm. so absolutely and, and the other thing you can do is you can do you can it's easy to become an angel investor whether you're doing that yeah. on a crowd platform or mm -hmm. you're a little angel syndicate put your money where your mouth is you'll probably learn a lot more than you might do in business school yeah no i totally agree great okay so between joel and i we've come up with three main topics of today um and the first one being what we've learned after reviewing probably a, more than 100,000 pitch decks between us. Um, Joel's probably done a few more than me, it sounds like, and of course on the LP side, but we'll have some really good insights there. Topic number two, serving the underserved, and that's a really big opportunity for entrepreneurs out there. And then number three, as we've mentioned earlier, startups are built on relationships and giving first, so we're going to delve into that. So let's go into number one. So um, uh, Joel, if you could start with us, um, or start for us rather, you've clearly seen a lot of pitch decks, as I say, both entrepreneurs pitching, and for the entrepreneurs out there who don't know, VCs also have to pitch for their own cash. So what are your top tips? Yeah, I think first impressions are everything. So it's hard to say that it's not relevant when it comes to decks. I mean, just, you know, they say don't ever judge a book by its cover, but the first impression that you see of a brand or a fund or a company, that's really what is going to stick in your mind as you flip through the slides. And if it looks sloppy or unprofessional, um, that might lead into questioning if the data is accurate, if there's a quality issue. Uh, you know, some of the best practices that I hear about financial modeling is have the formatting be very clear, um, have it look very neat and you know have a really strong uh rhythm for how you're building the financial models a lot of people use color coding where you know typically the the cells that are blue those are dynamic cells cells that are green are coming from another cell so you know really the structure and the format and the look and feel really is your first impression so i think that, you know it's just hard for me to avoid that if the deck looks like it's been professionally designed versus hacked together in a PowerPoint using like the PowerPoint template um, that that also gives you some first impressions on how much time they put into it. Now, are there unicorn companies that had ugly decks? Yes. Right. Um, but I would just say sometimes that first impression of the aesthetics um, and it may go back to my background being um, a product person 
uh, working on UX and UI and looking at designs all the time. You know, um, I really get delighted when I, I still get delighted when I book a trip on Airbnb because I just feel the customer experience uh, really does impact how you feel. So same thing, when you look at a deck at a startup or a fund, you know, I, I feel it's the same thing. If you don't have the, uh, the, the budget to hire a designer, there's a lot of great tools now like Canva. Canva has a lot of really great design templates. So some of the fund managers that have gone through my accelerator have used Canva. They didn't have to hire a designer. So sometimes that helps, but you know, we actually have a designer on the line, Pritham, he's a friend of mine. Um, I invited him to uh, pop in. So shout outs to Pritham if anybody wants uh, design help, I can circulate his contact info, but he's been helping me with a lot of cool stuff um, in the past. You know, when I look Thanks, at Joe. Dex, hey, it's Pritham. When I look at Dex, there's three things that I really look at. It's the TAM, the team, and the traction. So with me being a generalist, I do have various thresholds for what the valuation should be. And with a lot of fun conversations with Matthew, I know expectations of valuation are different in the UK versus in the US. Um, so I think the, being thoughtful of how the valuations could vary based on a deep tech company versus a consumer tech company. And you know that comes with just repetition. So I would say looking at a thousand decks of all different sectors, that really builds your skill set of understanding uh, you know, concerns that you see with a certain industry and then patterns that you see that prove that a company is going to be successful. So I think really refining the skill of just looking at a lot of decks and talking to a lot of companies helps you, uh, you know, pattern match and just build a thesis much faster. And, you know, when it comes to early stage VC, uh, you know, a lot of the decks, when it comes to funds, you're not going to have a lot of these crazy KPIs compared to like fund two and fund three. Um, so early stage venture funds are going to have mainly uh, data on deals that they have warehouse and then maybe some step ups in valuation. Um, and then, you know, everybody has proprietary deal flow. That's kind of the buzzword, but you want to, you want to dive deeper um, on if these funds actually have access to the winners that will outperform. So um, those are some nuggets that I have on just looking at fund decks and then also looking at company decks. But what are your thoughts on all these things, Alex? I thought that was brilliant. The, the TAM team and traction. I mean, that's it. That's all you need to get right. And, yeah. And the rest matters a lot less. So I wrote down a few things. I think, firstly, less is more. Uh, if an investor is overwhelmed, they'll just bin the deck. They could not be asked. Um, and on that, I think use infographics. You know, the adage of a picture's worth a thousand words. It really is. You know, investors don't want to read. If they had the time, of course they would, they just don't. So make it really easy and communicate as much information as you can, as succinctly as you can, and that will you know, be rewarded. And I think what I see a lot is, you know, don't be too creative with the truth. Yes, you need to pitch it in a positive way, but if you do embellish it a little bit too much later down the line in the investment process, you're gonna lose the trust of your investors and the deal might fall over. So try to be as truthful as possible. A very obvious one, contact information on page one. You'll be surprised how many decks don't have any, con on any contact information, um, not even on page one right at the end. Um, and I think, you know, understand what the purpose of the pitch deck is. It's just to pique interest. It's not to convey absolutely everything. Just give the investors like those three T's that Joel mentioned, give them those three T's. That's the main things. The rest you can cover later. Um, and I think lastly, don't drink your own Kool-Aid. Don't try and sell a bit of old rope that you know is not a good business. Like investors will know as much as you, if not more, and it won't go anywhere. Rather spend the time getting the business model right before you try and go and convince someone else of something you're not sure of yourself. Yep, all good points. Great stuff. Now, back to question 1.2. Um, you mentioned that when you're speaking to customers, Joel, that you need to see if you can solve their problems. Now, that's pretty obvious to you and me and many others around the room, but very few founders actually do this. Tell us a bit more about that. Well, you want to solve a problem as a founder. So what is the problem statement? What is happening in the current state? And what do you provide that improves the current state to something better. 
What is interesting is I was thinking about this late last night is a lot of times a customer doesn't really know what the problem is. So, you know, the famous quote from Henry Ford, if you asked your customers, what do you need? They're going to just tell you, we need faster horses. They're not going to think that they need a car because that's just out of the scope of their mental model. They never knew of this thing called a car. So the best product people, the people that are building startups are not only building what customers want, but also building what customers want, even when the customer doesn't even know they want it. So, you know, many of us probably can't imagine life without an iPad. And, you know, you would probably think, why do you need an iPad? You already have a phone, you already have a computer. Why do you need this middle device? But we brought that solution out as a, as a solution when the, when the customer didn't even really realize that they needed it. So I think the innovators that do that are the ones that can really think far and beyond. Do we really need an electric car? Do we really need to plant a chip in our head? Uh, you know, maybe after we talked to Elon, we realized that, hey, you know, it would actually make life better. Um, if we if we did that, it helps the environment. Um, maybe we can optimize our thought process. Uh, you know, we can solve blindness with these solutions that we didn't think could be um, a solution to our problem. Uh, even if you think about the the i the iPod, the iPod pretty much takes all of your compact discs and your albums and makes it available on one device, right? Before that world of the iPod, we just had thousands of CDs, right? We would have those albums that had like the CDs. I don't know if you remember those. I might be dating yeah. myself a little bit because there may, yeah. be some, there may be some Gen Zs in here. A small, um, a small one. Yeah, they're like, what's the CD? Uh, uh, what's that shiny coaster that you have there? But, you know, if you could think five to 10 years out, I think that's a good mindset. If you're building products that, you know, you know that customers will really think is valuable, ahead of your time and ahead of your customer's time. Uh, that's a start, especially when you think about deep tech, because deep tech, obviously it's uh, moonshot ideas that are still a decade out. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite quotes, and this comes back to my product manager days, customers are like little kids. So kids, I have a four-year-old, he thinks that he needs to eat candy every day, but you as the product person or the parent knows that candy is not good for them. They, they need to have a healthy diet, right? So same thing with your customers. Um, the customers, if you're like a fintech company, the customers may think that they need to scan checks and be able to process checks through a camera when really all you need is just a person to type in their credit card information and get their payment because people probably don't use mobile that much, but everybody uses desktop, right? So knowing what is good for the customer and knowing what's good for the business versus the customer, strictly relying on the customer to tell you what they think, right? Because they may just think they want candy. Um, so you need to always know what's best for the customer, even more than the customer thinks, uh, because a lot of times the customer is not a product person. They're not the entrepreneur. They're just consuming your product and they're either going to be really happy and give you um, a lot of referrals and be happy, or they're just going to be like, yeah, this product doesn't really solve what I really want. Um, so I think really understanding for me, what I want to hit home from just all that I've been talking about is really understand what the customer needs and will need even more than the customer needs. Absolutely, and, and you, you're taking a bird's eye view as well because you can survey a thousand customers and interview a hundred, and you're gonna know far more than each individual consumer and get ideas and then bring it back to them. So um, I think that's part of your role. And I'd just like to add to that, when I do commercial DD on deals and we say, look, can you give us some of your customers? We'd like to speak to them. And sometimes the entrepreneurs sit in on the call um, we don't always like that, but they say, wow, like you, I've learned things about my business that I didn't know about. And you think, wow, you know, do you, have you actually spoken to your customers? Do you know what they really want? And when you interview people, you find out people love being interviewed. They love being asked what their problems are and what the potential solutions might be. Um, and I think that's a big message to a lot of early stage entrepreneurs don't sit behind your laptop and build something. Go out and knock on doors and say, will you buy this? And then go and build it. And there's so many people, I find, that are so scared to actually do that. And those are the people that end up polishing the product and it never sees the light of day. So that's point one. Um, and I think, you know, it's an obvious one, but a lot, a lot of people say, I, I want to disrupt this market. And all of the truly disruptive businesses that have succeeded probably never set out to disrupt a the market. They, they sold an underserved 
uh, need or you know something that's being sold but poorly or at a really poor price point so you look at uber airbnb you know these problems were being solved with hotels and, and black cabs and, and you know, yellow cabs in, in new york but the customers were getting fleeced and if you focus on that say what's the customer pain how can i do it better you will be embraced and you'll do very very well um that's all i have to add on that so look let's jump into 1.3, uh, Joel, specifically you, I think more so you than me, during the pandemic, you helped lots of businesses. Um, did the model and execute, oh, sorry, excuse me, during the pandemic, of course, um, did the model and execution of those businesses look very different to the pitch decks and models that they thought they were going to use in the first place? Yeah, I mean, it's a, you got to really look at the entry point. So a lot of the companies that I met, you know, were before the pandemic. Some of them were even in the middle of the pandemic. And, um, you know, what I would say is a lot of companies might have had a physical presence. Many of those never went back to physical and they went to completely hybrid or fully digital. So obviously, if you have some type of prop tech company or some type of business that has uh, distribution or logistics, a lot of that might have had to been put on pause because it would have been hard to get workers to come out there and support you. Um, so you need to kind of move to a different model. So uh, I have seen a lot of decks change to a different strategy to really optimize on the on the remote aspect of COVID. Some of that improved businesses. So there were some businesses that I know, some education businesses that I know. There was a boot camp business that was doing really well that I, that I know that had physical boot camps all over the US and all of those boot camps became digital. So they had customers and what they realized was some of these in-person courses that people were offering, people after work are tired and they're hungry and they're cranky. <laughs> so that also impacts the customer experience, but that's the only time that people are available. Some people did want still an in-person interaction. And this company switched all of the in-person interactions to all completely Zoom. So what that did was actually provide a lot of cost savings for this company because now they don't have the overhead of having to do flexible workspaces to have access to those locations. And it also, what they also found, which is an interesting data point was the customers were actually just as happy being virtual. And if you think about it, if you're taking a class virtually at 8.30 p.m., uh, you know, after work, you, you're prob you've you probably been fed, you got a, maybe an hour to decompress, uh, you took a, you probably had some time to take a shower or maybe go to the gym. So your mindset is a little more relaxed and you're in a better mood. So what they found out was the customers were just as happy being completely virtual because they could probably multitask, they can probably turn their camera off for a second, um, they could probably eat while they're, you know, watching a lecture. So it provides much more flexibility. So some people were leaning in to the changes that were happening with the pandemic. And some people had to really rethink their business model because they got hit in a negative way. So whatever it was, I did see a lot of people changing their deck for the good and for the bad. And um, I think that provides a lot of opportunity, but then also challenges for them to uh, grow as a company through those pains. Absolutely. And, and what yeah. I saw was very much along the same lines that some things became easier and, and businesses that had physical presence could go online and they thought, this is great. You know, my, my cost of sales has come right down. I don't need this, all this rental costs on my P&L. But what they didn't factor in is that everyone else thought the same way. And a lot of VC money pumped into the sector and all of those opportunities evaporated very quickly and became a very competitive. And some took advantage, some didn't. And I think the only lesson I took away from it is you should, you know, it's never going to be easy. You need to continually fight, push the boundaries, be the hardest working person in the room. Otherwise, at some stage, someone's going to eat your lunch. And, you know, the only time you can truly rest is when you hit that exit. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Super. All right, great. Let's, let's, move on to number two question bank two so serving the underserved a passion of yours and mine um, and i know you're very passionate about that uh joel do you want to talk us a bit through that yeah i mean one of your questions is really 
being passionate about building things that solve problems. So I think whenever you're trying to solve a problem, all you have is really your superpower, whether you have a financial background, you have a design background, you have a tech background, that's your secret sauce, that's your superpower. So you just have to lean into that. And whatever I tell you or whatever Alex tells you, that is not gonna work for you. You have to find your own you know, strategy and your own secret sauce that you feel comfortable with because you may hate financial modeling where somebody else really nerds out on that. My superpower, I've always been into art and design and that's why that was the sexy part of product management that I enjoyed, really building products from scratch. And another superpower that came about not by choice, was just having to adapt quickly. And, and that was because I changed jobs a lot early in my career because I just, I would be in a certain industry and not be completely happy and really set a goal to do something different. And I was kind of a master of being able to pivot and trying to re-narrate re my story so that there's alignment with where the opportunity is going, right? And try to find a way where I can add value. So I think really rethinking, if you're not happy and you want to pivot, um, trying to find a strategy to do that, whether it's from engineering to product management or product management to consulting or to venture, really thinking through how you can um, switch that to, um, to serve any kind of goal. And what we're talking about is the underserved. So for me, really trying to find pathways uh, where I can help other people make those pivots. You know, if they're not happy or there's just not the resources, one thing that I'm really passionate about someday is to make it so that anybody can be a VC. If there's a technology available where anybody in the world can source deals and they're actually taken seriously by, uh, you know, partners, that's really innovative. And you don't really have the barriers of pedigree and privilege to be able to break into any industry, right? And I'm already starting to see this with some companies like Google. So you don't have to have a college degree to be an engineer at Google. You can actually go through Google's uh, online virtual education program and prove that you have those skills. And I believe that we're heading towards a skill-based economy where you can actually get jobs and prove that uh, you're the best candidate just from showing and demonstrating that you have those skills. So those are things that I think would, could be really exciting to be able to solve some of those problems of maybe the underserved not having, having access to the education or the opportunities. Mm. Yeah, very well said. And from my side, I guess, you know, engineers solve problems, that's what they do. And yeah. then entrepreneurs do that in, in more ways than one. So they, they use some of those skill sets and more. Um, and then in terms of an investor, they enable entrepreneurs to solve those problems. So the scales that much more, and of course, LP is above that. So that's great. Yeah. And I think um, one of the things that, that I wrote down was, you know, for me, it's when you're thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, it's about the mindset you go in with. And I read a blog post and it said, you know, most people want to make a million dollars or 10 or a hundred, whatever your figure is. But if you flip that on its head, say, how do I solve a million people's problem? And you just relentlessly pursue that goal, you're going to be far more likely to hit your million dollars. And hopefully that, you know, the, the, the former is your real goal, because think about the, grad, you know, the sense of accomplishment you'll actually, you know, achieve if, if, if you reach that goal. And for me, it also goes one step further. Um, instead of just focusing on people, you know, I come from a uh, you know, semi-third world country in South Africa and there's a lot of inequality and I was always told, how can I solve their problems? Now I'm going one step further and saying, I want to help people who are helping the planet. So you end up hitting both. So that's my, my mission in life. And um, if I can elaborate on that, you know, the UK has this net 2050, the net zero 2050 goal. And I think by the time that happens, I'll be 65 and if I spend the rest of my career doing that and I get to 65, even if I don't make any money, it still would have been a good use of my life. And, and that's what guides me. Sure. And can you unpack, you know, whatever you're allowed to share a little more on the Development Bank of Wales? And I'm sure they also have a lot of initiatives with their deep tech initiatives and um, obviously looking at climate change. Um, can you just tell us a little more about that organization and you know the, the venture arm and what you guys are are focused on and kind of what what your investment thesis is 
Yeah, certainly. So it was basically set up as a, a you know, to kickstart the Welsh economy. So the Welsh economy used to be a lot of mining, coal mining specifically, very poor and, you know, um, and wasn't doing well in the new world order. Um, so it was that filling the funding gap. And then I think it's really evolved into, you know, it's a, you know, we're, there's lots of different parts of Debt Development Bank of Wales, and now there's the venture arm. And what we're finding is there's as good entrepreneurs, if not better or the best in the world, than there is in the UK. And a lot of really successful businesses, such as Skyscanner, if you know of it, originated in Wales. So it's, you know, it's all about just access to funding in terms of what Development Bank of Wales does is it funds, you know, probably pre-seed, um, takes that early risk in entrepreneurs just after friends and family, uh, an institution on the cap table, and then follows on through multiple rounds and helps scale up and then invests alongside all of the other VCs in the UK specifically, who usually come in at Series A. And DBW invests alongside angels at those early stages when no one really wants to back the entrepreneurs in that value of death where there is no capital. And the US is obviously a lot better for it. Um, and we're hoping that more VCs come down to that, um, that funding stage and um, all of a sudden we'll have a lot more co-investors, but it's got more risk appetite than a traditional VC would, would have. Um, and as I say, even with that, it's not that, you know, the returns are often exceptional. So it's not that there's more risk, it's just that people don't know how to price it, people don't know how to quantify it. And the skill set of a lot of UK VCs, if I may, is largely financial. And when you come down to grassroots entrepreneurship and pre-seed, those skills that you need are hardcore entrepreneurship, really understanding value propositions, focusing on customers, because you can't just analyze the churn and MRR and CAC and LTV, that doesn't exist yet. Um, and that's the bit of entrepreneurship and venture that I really love. Sure. No, that was really good. And I appreciate you sharing the additional insight because it's always interesting to see the strategic initiatives of larger institutions and then how they align with the investment community. And you guys are super active. So that's really great to see. And uh, what you're doing in, in, uh, in Europe and in your region is really exciting to see because you're building an ecosystem and that provides access to talent and deal flow and, and just economic development as a whole. So thanks for all that you do. Absolutely. Thanks very much. And, you know, if you play in that space, mm -hmm. you become like the, the feeder fund for the rest of the ecosystem. So all the big raises that you see, where did they start with those pre-seed little, you know, kernels? So anyway. Yeah. Great. Totally. Now... <laughs> Moving on to 2.2, um, we've spoken a lot about underserved people and giving access to people who you know, wouldn't usually have access to certain things like venture capital and maybe consumer goods. And on that, I saw a post on LinkedIn the other day saying that UK firms, and I don't know about US, I'm sure it's similar, but UK firms are leaving 4.5 billion on the table through ignoring black, Asian, and multi-ethnic consumer market in the UK alone, let alone across you know, the rest of the world, quite shocking. Um, but focusing that question, can you talk us through the power of entrepreneurs focusing on these underserved markets? Yeah, I think there's two, for me, the way I look at it, there's two pieces to this, right? There's diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then there's um, underserved markets. So with Diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think we all have a responsibility to provide pathways and access to, um, to all of those communities, both on the funding side as a, as a venture capitalist, opening up more opportunities uh, for diverse managers, but also managers elevating them to be general partners. I think that's also feedback that I've been hearing. Um, you know, all of us are accountable to, to elevate great leaders, no matter what background or uh, sexual orientation they have or, or belief they have, you know, we should be able to have access um, to elevate more managers. And then the underserved markets, what I've seen, which is really interesting, is there's a lot of talent in these tertiary markets. So outside of Silicon Valley and New York City and London and Hong Kong, there's 
other regions where there's just hotbeds of talent. And a lot of times some of the venture funds are just following what Tiger Global's last investment was. So there's a lot of FOMO. They're just kind of following what the, the market leaders are investing in when there's really a lot of great opportunities in these other markets where there's a lot of innovation happening because of the the um, the maybe the scarcity and some of the opportunities. People are able to be a lot more resourceful. They're able to be much more capital efficient. So having an open mind and looking at all the markets and finding where all the opportunities are is very exciting. And that's why we've also invested cross border because we've seen just some amazing innovation outside of the primary areas. You know, we've invested in India, uh, Nigeria, Asia, and um, there's just those markets are really, really booming with talent. And um, one of the funds that was in my program last cohort, they specifically focus on these tertiary markets where there's amazing founders. A lot of times too, you can get better terms and better valuation with just really, really high quality companies, right? You can get probably a typical $40 million company for probably half that or maybe a third of that because of just the region and it's um, the, the expenses are much cheaper too. So there are some opportunities for capital efficiency when you think about those markets too. Mm, absolutely, very well said. And building on that, I think, you know, everyone's competing for the same piece of pie. Everyone's got the same TAM B2B software selling to the same corporates and you can imagine how many decks yeah. those corporations appear uh, are on. Yeah. And um, you know, if you look at, the, you know, a lot of, I find a lot of people are very ignorant about the opportunities out there because it's just out of their purview, or out of their comfort zone. And one that really comes to mind is the hair extension market in Africa, um, in North Africa, Nigeria, Ghana. Yeah. Like that is probably bigger than the TAM of most of the decks that you and I see yet people probably haven't even heard of it. And uh, so there's just so much untapped potential. So not only is it the right thing to do to um, you know, help these underserved customers, because they, you know, people like you and me who have real needs and wants, and, you know, they are willing to pay for it. Just no one's taken the time to actually provide the services that they want. And if you say you're an entrepreneur and your mission is to solve people's problems, well, you know, open your eyes if I may be so blunt. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Great. Um, and now we've touched on briefly on, on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and we know it's a big problem in VC, and it appears to be having an effect on the uh, types and numbers of entrepreneurs that are getting funded. Um, how do you recommend entrepreneurs ensure that they have equal opportunity, if not more, to try and make up for it? I think what entrepreneurs could do is build, you know, try to see where the platforms and communities are that are supporting that. That's something that an entrepreneur um, could do. And, you know, there are programs out there now. I'm seeing a lot more programs for, uh, and there's also funds that have a thesis specifically on diverse uh, founders. So I think, you know, trying to find out where those communities are could be helpful, but I don't think the founders should have to do that at the same time. I think it's not where it should be. And I think we all have the responsibility to provide awareness so that founders don't have to go looking for those uh, channels and Slack communities and, and uh, you know, events that kind of support that. They, you know, we, we just need as a community to build more awareness uh, so that founders don't have to look for it or even ensure it. You know, it should be part of the DNA of the whole asset management ecosystem. And I don't think we're there yet. So I think um, doing more things where we can kind of support that. Um, again, you know, as I mentioned before, we all have that responsibility to support that ecosystem. And um, there's still a lot of room for improvement. Um, you know, I really love some of the funds like Har Harlem Capital that focus specifically their whole thesis and their, their mission too. So I think a lot of times you have to be mission driven to be able to be aligned to this. But, you know, one of their missions, which I really love, is they, they focus specifically on uh, black Latinx and female founders. So providing and they do track that as well. So now there is an accreditation, I think, that you can have. So I think more accountability on the fund managers and the communities is really what needs to be done to ensure that. But there are accreditations now where you can show that you're accredited as a um, as a diverse entity and yeah. you you follow all those best practices so 
I think having better governance, having better expectations and putting those things in place to, um, to ensure that, to your point, right, is really important. Um, and then really just building the, the platform to the funds as well, because the funds are the asset managers that have the AUM that can be empowered to deploy more capital to the founders. So it does really, um, you know, start at the fund and then the fund also can deploy capital. So I think it needs to happen at all the levels, pretty much mm -hmm. at the LP level, at the VC level, and then, you know, obviously the portfolio company level. Yeah, and, and I think it, it is happening, and I think that's my main message, that the, the yeah. wheels of change are happening. There's higher powers, there's people who can affect that change that are making it happen, particularly yeah. the LP driving behavior of VCs, and the general partners there driving behavior of their associates and so forth. And I think as an entrepreneur, I wouldn't direct any negative energy into it because you're probably just going to get frustrated and run out of steam. I would stay on mission and focus on being the best entrepreneur that you can be and solving the pain, solving the problems, coming up with a you know resilient pitch. Don't rock up with a chip on your shoulder. Uh, no one's saying it's not happening. I'm not saying that. I'm saying don't feed that dog. Don't buy into that negative energy because yeah. you know if you come across someone like me, you know I will evaluate it. And I like you know everyone has biases. I understand that. Um, that's human nature, but I like to think that I evaluate every deck on equal footing. Um, and so just, and if you come in with a kind of negative attitude, that negativity is going to rub off and you're going to do yourself a disservice. So don't even think about it is what I say. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I All totally right. agree. Mm. No, thanks, Joe. Okay, so this move on to question bank number three startups are built on solid relationships as we know and joel i know a big bugbear of yours is weird selfish people who are takers i, I like that sentence um and in the, the context of startups can you elaborate on the shortcomings of this behavior yeah i mean i think the whole industry in general is a long-term relationship-based industry Right. So what you see oftentimes is you see, and I'm seeing this a lot now, a lot of founders, they get support from VCs and it's a long term relationship. It's a seven year. Usually now it's getting on 10 years, right, of how long it takes for a company to IPO. So you're really building this long term relationship. So you could probably get a quick funding round and be super transactional. But, you know, what happens is um, the quick benefit that you get kind of diminishes, diminishes over time because a lot of times these founders have some type of liquidity event. They may start their own venture fund. They may also be an LP in multiple other funds as well. So big, big trend that I'm seeing in the emerging manager ecosystem is a lot of LPs are other venture funds that want to back and support uh, smaller venture funds with angel checks. So I just feel that relationships are everything. And, you know, I, I think the best way to do it when it comes to long, solid relationships is instead of being transactional and say, hey, you know what, let's work for this one specific deal. Um, let's build a long-term relationship on how we can add value to each other. And I think that long-term value compounds over time, those relationships, uh, because we're all growing as people, right? There's some people that I've seen that I've known from 10 years ago. Um, they were a small founder they built the business up, they scaled, and now they're a VC, and now I invest in them, but now they're also LPs as well. So one thing that I'll say too is just be kind to everybody because you never know, you'll never underestimate where what they'll become in the next five mm -hmm. to 10 years, and they may be your boss at some point, right? So if you're super transactional and you kind of rub them the wrong way or you know maybe they didn't give you something and you kind of write them off, um, that might, you might lose some amazing friendships and relationships that could have compounded over time from being super transactional. So I think, think about like what you could add value to someone else with. And then I think those dividends will compound on time. Even if you don't get anything in the beginning, um, I think those relationships really um, it, it'll pay off somehow, you know, and I think that's just how I am. And that's how I know the, you know, a lot of my friends kind of from the venture ecosystem, I really just invested a lot in those relationships. And I think they pay off over time. And especially with fund managers as well, you know, learning that I had too, when, you, when you're an LP, a lot of times you wanna watch a whole fund 
for their whole cycle before you even invest. So even in that instance, it's hard to be transactional because they really want to get to know you over time. Um, but that's my thoughts, but we'll love your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I don't want to label the point anymore because I have exactly the same thoughts. Yeah. Um, you won't get very far if you're a taker. It's a small ecosystem. It's built on people, you know, give give first. And, um, and as you say, things take a long time to come to fruition. And people remember, and there's that very good saying, uh, people won't remember what you said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Used yeah. and um, you know later down the line it might not serve you. And we're in a in an industry where you know VC and startups where you disrupt, where you create large amounts of value very quickly. So the the wheels could shift dramatically and most likely will uh, and make sure that you you, you treat everyone equally um, and with great respect. Yeah, and I'd say even with your career things do compound over time. And a lot of times I think what happens is we, there was a book by Mo Gauda and one of his principles, he, he wrote the book, Engineering Happiness. So he worked at mm -hmm. Google for some time and he actually took a scientific approach to finding happiness. And what he found was a lot of times we feel that we're unhappy because our expectations didn't happen. But mm -hmm. maybe what you expected, like maybe you expected to become a venture capitalist and become a millionaire by the end of the year um, and you don't become a millionaire by the end of the year. So you feel that you're unhappy, but in reality, you actually still have a lot of great things going on in your life. You have a, you have health, you have a family, you found an amazing life partner. You just didn't become a millionaire. So you feel in your mind, you're unhappy. Um, so I think if you can switch that and, and really focus on, you know, or am I making progress towards that goal? Because, you know, it sometimes it takes longer um, that might help, but I think really it's it's um, it's trying to figure out and have fun through the journey. Because for me too, I mean, it took me a while to break into venture capital. Uh, before that, I was an engineer. Then I was a product manager, and um, you know, by luck, there was a fund that kind of liked my background. So I think, but I, but if I didn't have that background, I probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have been as attractive for that one role. You know, because they were looking for a weird candidate that had some of my skills. Um, you know, and I mean, for the longest time, I was the same way. I was like, wow, you know, I'm not where I want to be this year. And, yeah. you know, that ate at me for a while. But then over time, I just tried to have fun with the journey. And then I think when I switched my mindset, um, you know, it kind of worked out somehow. Even if it didn't work out at the timeline that I gave myself, um, I think it ended up working out somehow. Yeah, no, I, I like that. And it comes down to, as I say, the energies as well. If you focus, oh, I didn't achieve first. I don't care what happens. I'm on the journey. I'm on mission. I'm creating, I'm producing content. I'm building communities. I'm sourcing decks, whatever it is, you will get there. So um, follow your passion and, and don't give up and you'll end up being very fulfilled, whether you get the VC job or not, or whatever it is you, you're yeah. aspiring to. Yeah, right. absolutely. And, um, Mm. And um, I want to stick a go, come back to this transactional nature of, of relationships, particularly in this post COVID world where it's online and people, you know, you can't have a coffee, you can't have that organic meeting, and people are really struggling um, with that. Even people that perhaps weren't so transactional before. Do you want to just talk us through your experience and maybe share a bit of advice on that? Yeah, I would say it's tough with COVID, but you can use what you have. You know, you can you can try to do virtual coffee events, um, try to use the technology that they have now to to build an engaging experience. Uh, I think in the heat of COVID, we did this. We did a hackathon uh, just for fun, and I invited my cohort and I invited just outside people and. And we had a lot of fun. We, we came together and built something together. It was really, it was a lot of fun. So the people in the cohort, along with just other entrepreneurs, uh, tech operators, uh, we broke up into six teams and then we had everybody build something and it forced people to get together, even though we weren't in person. So I think you can still bring people together and, and have fun, even if it's in a safe way where it's virtual. But I think, um, I think just trying to find ways to do that and and um, and still have a good 
a good sentiment with everybody, I think is super important. And I think that's how you can still kind of do that relationship building. You know, most people probably saw an acceleration in their LinkedIn connections with people because mm -hmm. they just can't go to events. Uh, so I think, you know, some of the most popular platforms obviously were Zoom, Calendly, and uh, obviously LinkedIn. And, you know, I'm probably missing one or two, but mm -hmm. um, I'd say, you know, Zoom, Calendly, and what, there's probably one more um, that, that everybody uses. But, you know, definitely for me, I'm power users of those platforms. But, you know, look, if you can't meet people in person, uh, try to have those hybrid or online channels. I'm very happy in New York. I don't know how it is in London, but, you know, things have been opening up and then now they're shutting down a little bit. But, you know, we did have to, we were able to have a couple in-person events uh, as long as everybody showed their COVID vaccinations and all that. Um, so, you know, I, I think this year, hopefully, you know, because what, what I've learned too is typically a pandemic is around three years. So hopefully this year may wrap up the end of the pandemic. But again, I don't know, you know, but, but it, you know, that would be great if this year was kind of the end of that um, and people can start you know, doing hybrid or in-person community building. Mm. Yeah, no, in London, it also felt like it opened up and now it's mm -hmm. shutting down slightly, yeah. but I think it changed very soon. But mm -hmm. those in-person events that everyone went to, they realized, okay, let's be more human, be a nice person, you know, build relationships. And then they went back to sit behind their computers and thought, oh, maybe I shouldn't be so transactional. Yeah. And I think my, my two pennies on it is show up and add value first and be truly philanthropic, give without expecting anything in return and do that a hundred times over and you will get back everything you want and more. You know, it's, it's not a, it's not a nil sum game. There is an infinite number of opportunities and value that could be had. So don't think it's one for one. It's never like that. No, I agree. Great. Now we must talk about uh, founder issues, and uh, because they often cause startups to fail. And and one of the favorite um, st stacked websites I look at is CV Insights, and they say this is the top reason why it failed is because they didn't raise follow-on funding, and then number two because they had no market need, and number three whatever it might be. And team issues is probably somewhere down there, maybe number five. Meanwhile. Um, I think co-founder conflict is massive, and I think that you know what we said on a, on a recent podcast that just came out was that the team is in charge of all of that. So if your startup's failing, well, hello. Um, anyway, I don't want to steal your thunder, Joel. Tell us your thoughts. Yeah, you you touched on a couple points that I'd like to dive a little further on and double click on. I mean, one of them is team. So sometimes. Founders have different goals. And, you know, when you're picking your team members, maybe there's different things that are going on in your life and you have different values um, and you have different visions of your capacity and involvement in the company and where you want to take the company. There may be, a, for example, there may be a CEO that knows that he or she wants to build this company and take it to uh, take it to Series A in a certain amount of time. And maybe the CTO is a part time CTO and they have a full time job and, and you know, they've got they've got a family and they've got kids and they're dealing with a lot of other things that are possibly a distraction and probably impacting the roadmap for execution. So misalignment, you know, due to lack of communication could be an issue uh, where just teams don't get along and they fail. So I've seen that. Um, another big thing is handling cash flow and execution. So a lot of times you're not really managing how much is in your bank uh, effectively. So you're spending a lot of money on marketing and, you know, your infrastructure and expenses, and you're not making that much. So you're making, you're spending more than you're making. And that leads to cash flow issues. And that could be a huge issue down the line. You may just run out of runway. So one of the mm -hmm. biggest issues is just, can you raise a lot of money very fast? And are you able to, are you able to get sales and get, you know, money into the business to keep it alive and, and, and reinvest in it? to grow. Sometimes if you reinvest too fast, again, you just don't have cash to, to scale. So really balancing how you're um, staying afloat, but then scaling uh, hopefully every year is something that's a fine balance. And, you know, I mentioned this earlier, most startups take about seven to 10 years 
to exit. So I would say that's, you know, I don't know how the stats are in the UK, but in America, that's the average time of a marriage. So picking the right partner is just as important as picking a spouse, making sure that that person is there for the long haul. And then also the investors are there for the long haul. They're there to, um, to, to help you grow and scale and, and create value um, and, and really just communication. So some people just don't communicate. Um, one of my favorite people that I reference and people might laugh, um, there was an episode of Steve Harvey and uh, he was talking about couples that can't communicate well. And, you know, sometimes what happens when a couple doesn't communicate well is what was said was not heard. So that means if I ask you, or, you know, if your partner asks you to do the dishes, maybe what you heard is, hey, just do the dishes at some point where do the dishes might actually mean, can you do the dishes right now? You know, cause it needs to be done. And you know, what was said was not heard. And I think that's a huge issue. Uh, with founders too, you know, when, when you are looking at deliverables, when you're looking at fundraising targets, uh, if what was said was not heard. And, you know, sometimes it hel it's helpful to repeat back what you think you heard, because what you think you heard may not actually be what was meant to be said. Um, so I think just basic communication, and I'll, I'll leave you with that. But I'd love to hear your points as well. And I know we're a couple minutes over, but I got time. No, great. Thanks very much. Yeah, I think uh, people think communication is speaking and sending the message when it's actually about receiving. So I think a lot of people spend 70% on average talking and 30% listening. So if you've got two people, you're like, well, where, where's that remaining 40% going that you're both speaking? It's being lost. 40% times two, 80%, uh, you know, it's being completely lost. So I think there's a very good uh, analogy saying, two years, one month, use it in that order. Um, and that applies to marriage and uh, startup founding teams. And in terms of founders, um, you know, first of all, the length of, of, a, of a startup uh, before it exits, it's often, I think, longer than a marriage, they say, and, and maybe people in the UK aren't that faithful. So maybe that's uh, you're better off in the US, but it's a very long journey. And my advice would be, you know, take a long time picking your co-founder as you would in a marriage, you know, date your co-founder, date your VCs, not literally, but really get to know them before you jump in bed with them and find someone who's different to you and isn't afraid to challenge you um, and has a different skill set and background. Um, because if you're all the same, whether that's co-founders or team members, you probably won't make it, you probably won't be innovative and you won't be able to stay with the times. And, Coming back to an example you mentioned, Joel, about spending too fast, not keeping an eye on your cash flow and your bank account. Like from my perspective, what that usually is, that's usually a relationship dynamic or a cultural issue where the financial person is, you know, not taken seriously, doesn't have a voice, bulldozed by the CEO. And that's why it happens, not because they didn't have the skill set to analyze a PL or cash flow. What's your view? I totally agree. I mean, sometimes they look if the person is not able to uh, really think through how to uh, to manage those expenses and they're just handling expenses differently than um, that maybe some other team thinks they should be. That's just going to get you down to a dead downward downward spiral. So I think really, again, being in alignment, what is our budget? You know, how much did we agree to be spending a month? Uh, we, you know, and then some businesses are more challenging. I've seen this where you only get paid 60 days from now. So there's also a lead time, you know, you're going to get paid, but you don't have any money for 60 days. So really managing, you know, very a tight budget. And I think part of that comes to discipline. If some person is very disciplined and the other person is not, that could be okay. But if both people are just so laissez faire and they don't have discipline, um, that could really get down to cash flow issues. And make sure you don't have a crossover of skill set. Make sure where your skill set ends, theirs picks up. If you're both, you know, product people, make sure you've got a marketer, make sure you've got a, a finance person, make sure you've got all the skills in your wheelhouse to ex execute on the critical success factors you need to in order to achieve the business plan that you set out to do or gave to investors. Otherwise, you're done. Yes, you can hire people in, but you should have all those complementary skills under one roof before you set out. Yeah, absolutely. 
Great. Okay, I'm going to summarize it and then we can come to you for some concluding thoughts um, if you have any time left. So uh, going back to the review, what reviewing 100,000 plus pitch decks teaches you, uh, you said first impressions count. Uh, if you don't have a designer, use Canva. Uh, if you need to focus on three things, focus on your TAM, your team, and your traction, triple T. I like that one, Jill. Um, make sure also that you actually interview your customers before your VCs do, because it might be a bit embarrassing and you might be building the wrong product. Get up and, and actually speak to people. And finally, solve a customer problem now, but also look forward five, 10 years to what that might be then, because they might not even be thinking about that and you'll come up with a truly innovative um, you know, product which has a long-term source of competitive advantage and differentiation. Number two, serving the underserved. Um, all disruptive companies focused on serving an underserved market and a very strong customer pain. They didn't set out to disrupt. Uh, number two, uh, underserved model. 2.2, underserved, underserved markets are untapped potential for entrepreneurs. So if you really want to make a lot of money and help a lot of people, that's where you should look. And then in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think don't focus negative energy on it. Yes, be cognizant of it, but stay on mission and make sure that you uh, don't get uh, swayed. Uh, and then question bank number three, startups are built on solid relationships. Remember, VC and startup is a long-term relationship game and your behavior will come full circle, whether that's positive or negative. In a post-COVID world, don't be so transactional. Lead with value first um, and be truly philanthropic. Don't expect anything in return and you will be adequately rewarded. And then in terms of your founding team, take time to pick your co-founders. It's going to be a long relationship. People that pick, pick people that are different to you, have different skill sets, and hopefully pick someone who's better than you because you're going to be more successful. So thanks again, Joel. Anything else you'd like to add to that summary? Yeah, I, I think I'm good. Uh, can we go on mute, please? Yeah, so I, I think I'm good. I, I resonate with everything that you said. Um, do we have maybe a few minutes for a couple questions from the audience, if there is any? Great. So, so Farouk had a question about industry news for emerging fund managers. I, I think a really great tool is going to Twitter and hashtagging OpenLP, also hashtag ProudLP, and there's tons and tons of strings around emerging managers. Blue Future Partners is a LP. They've came in. Um, you know, in the past as like a guest speaker, they have a lot of great content. They're a fund to fund um, that invests globally. So they have a lot of great, I'm actually looking for their blog. You can't find it right now, but if you just Google um, Blue Future Partners, you'll probably see some of their posts probably under their platform. Um, yeah, there's actually some stuff here. So if you go to Blue Future Partners, I'll ping the link of the website. They do post a lot of great content that I've referenced around um, you know, emerging managers and fund managers, but, you know, any other questions, guys, for Alex and I? All right, I guess we're good. Right, uh, in, in the meantime, do you want to, while people have a think, do you want to tell us where we can find you online and um, get in touch if we need to? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, Joel Palafinkel, and then I'm also on Twitter. It's at Joel Palaf. And you can just DM me there. Great. And uh, I'm, I'm on uh, at the Tippy Top blog on most social media platforms, uh, from Instagram to TikTok to Twitter. And of course, I'm on LinkedIn as well. Alexander Lee, look me up and uh, drop me a message if you'd like to get in touch. Great. Thank you so much, Alex.